opportunity to speak to everyone. It's good to see a good crowd. Uh, here's somebody, I was a student here from 86 through 90, so spent four years here and then came back from 94 to 98 before I retired as a professor in the electrical engineering department here. So I had to spend eight years of my 20 out here in Monterey. It was a tough life and, and all that kind of stuff. Lived up on Revere up in La Mesa most of the time. Uh, give you some idea, on behalf of Captain Dan Gaelic, who is the program manager for PMW 161, it's a program office within SPAWAR, the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command, under Admiral, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Gauss. PMW 161 has a unique charter compared to all other program offices in that you think of a program office usually as somebody that builds a specific system and delivers it. PMW-161 has a unique requirement in that it, is it has to manage, acquire and manage and life cycle cost the information assurance products for the entire Navy. For example, we buy every piece of cryptograph cryptographic equipment for the Navy. And we have to manage the life cycle for every KG-84 that's out there. Every STU, every STE telephone unit. We centrally procure and life cycle. Uh, all of the network assurance items for CIPRANET, NIPRANET, all of those systems are managed out of this office. So rather than being specific project oriented, we tend to be Navy enterprise oriented in our scope. So what I want to talk today is the, what we look at right now as a brief tutorial about where PMW-161 and the Navy overall is going in the area of information assurance. I'm sure everyone has read the foundation document that came out in June describing how we as a nation are going to protect our information infrastructure. And I'm sure you're infinitely familiar, intimately familiar with these four fundamental documents. I usually set them over by the uh, certain thrown in a certain room and they're good to pick up every, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, they all address specific areas, but what's the bottom line that all of these documents are saying? It's the same guiding thing that we at 161 have to say today, and that is the networks have no, are no longer an extra. They have become part of the integrated operations of the Navy. In fact, about three weeks ago at the, the Integrated Naval Network Symposium, one of the major operational commanders came up and said, Nippernet connection to the internet is today a Navy operational requirement for me to go to battle. Think about that. Tremendous impact. If you don't know what information assurance is, this is officially what it is, and I've highlighted the five ideas in one area and the three in the other, but if you wanted to sum it up in buzzwords, this is what we mean when we speak of information assurance across the Department of Defense. Take those five areas, normally you talk about this as the five things you gain from cryptographic activities, but really they are a fundamental part of information assurance for the Navy. For example, if you're in the Navy and you're in the Naval Supply Systems Command, you better make sure your acquisition system complies with the uniform state codes for electronic transactions. There was a law signed in by Governor Davis the 1st of January that now says an exchange of emails is a verbal contract. What can you use a digital signature on? Basically, any transaction now under the Uniform Commercial Code other than what are called archive documents, birth certificates, death certificates, 
things like that. Which, by the way, on Prop 22, that's the big issue. I don't know if you voted and all that stuff. It's a real issue. One state, one entity, one international community must be able to recognize an official document published by another one. So Prop 22 said California wouldn't recognize the, birth, the marriage certificate of another state. Well, that has a huge implication. Will a contract issued by a federal government agency in one state be recognized in another state? Or do we have to have 50 different sets of laws to have to comply with? One certificate authority is recognized by one state, but the same certificate authority is not recognized by another state. Lots of issues involved. So these are the areas that we talk about, and in the IA service area, we address these five. Non-repudiation is always a good one. That's the one that says, no, you really did it, and you can't back out of this one. Lots of fundamental issues here. In the protection side, we look at these five areas from a Navy enterprise that we have to deal with every single day. Uh, the Navy Times article last week, if you didn't see it, about how a change in the Pacific Fleet firewall policy raised a huge stink was an issue about defending the fleet enclave boundary. Part of that security policy enforcement is done via a product called a firewall. So, we look across these communities, across these six areas of protection. Detection. One of the questions was asked in a meeting a little bit earlier today was, how can you tell if somebody broke into your network? How do you tell if somebody broke into your home? Something's missing or a door's open? That's not the rule of today's cyber criminal. By the way, what's the number one most sought after piece of information that the commercial side of the IT world that people are trying to steal? What is it? Oh, credit cards are way down the list. You missed the point. What's the number one piece of information? Your fellow workers' salaries. Number one sought after piece of information by uh, insiders. Interesting issue. So how do you tell somebody got into the labor file and read everybody's salary so when he negotiates or she negotiates his salary next time, he now works at an advantage compared to all the other employees? Very interesting issue. In the Navy, in the Department of Defense, we have intrusion detection spread across the Navy enterprise. All right, radar hack. You have this scope, right, blips. There's something fundamental to radar called probability of detection versus probability of false alarm. And you tweak it just right so you know you're going to get the missile without having to chase 100,000 every minute. What do you think today's false alarm rate is to true intrusion across the Navy networks? Think about this on a radar scope. We get 250,000 false alarms for every single positive. And by the way, there's a nice correlation. If you plot number of intrusions across the Navy networks, they tend to go up around the 1st of September and tend to go down around the 1st of June. But anyway, if you didn't get that, it's the school year. But anyway, uh, Detection is a big issue, and a major command is being set up right now under uh, Sync Space under the auspices of the Joint Task Force, Force for Computer Network Defense to develop what is known as the Common Information Assurance Operating Picture for the Department of Defense. Reaction. Now, if your network's being attacked, what do you want to do, right? Want to draw and go out guns blazing after the person, right? You're going to chase them through cyberspace and get them and you're going to whack their hard drive. <laughs> well, there is this little cowboy image of that. By the way, that's illegal for you as a federal government employee to do. You don't go do that. You don't go do trace routing. In fact, we were talking the other day about if somebody broke into my system, do I even want to let them know that I know they broke in? How long do I let them kind of wander around so I can, you know, it's kind of like the idea. If you let, how, how far do you let the burglar come in before you shoot him? All the way in the house. <laughs> At least all the way in the house. <laughs> At least all the way in the house. So, 
We talk in every weapons system about an OODA loop. And the key there is action. What am I going to do should I get a wide scale denial of service attack on one of the networks we now call essential for operations of the name? Here are the most common threats that we see. We see a little bit of, of all of these. Uh, All kinds of stuff. Physical access is a real issue. We were talking one of the guys why they didn't move their server down here to get bigger bandwidth. Well, it takes too long to get a new lock on the door to move it down there. So we're still dealing with that in the Navy. But here's the most common threats we see. If you're going to go out and put out a network today, you're going to have to consider information assurance. You're going to have to decide what your system is doing, how the data will be protected, and especially like all of the old legacy systems that are out there that are now being network enabled, remember that term, what it will do to the networks. These are the three fundamental documents that we deal with daily for the United States Navy. These are the three regulatory documents that say this is what you're going to do and here's the reason why. Here are the responsibilities, especially across Navy with the new OPNAV instructions. <coughs> They all point to something called the DITSCAP instruction, DOD-wide requirement to take a truly objective look at what you're doing from a security standpoint. Now, why would this be a security issue? You're going to hook up a new system. Well, it's not new. You know, you've had it out there forever and ever and ever. I'm in. But now I'm going to network enable it that will let me bring up high-resolution, drawings of every single component of the F-18E system aboard any carrier at sea. Now why would that be something you would worry about from an information assurance standpoint? Well, the fact that the high resolution drawing is 270 megabytes in length and seeing as how today you have a 56 kilobit connection, what have you effectively done to your network? You have attacked your own network and created a denial of service for all other users on that network. You have to think about that. Remember, today as I speak, 31 ships in the Pacific Fleet still get their total Nippernet, Cipernet, and JLIX connectivity through one 56K dial-in line via Inmarsat that you lose every 11 minutes as the ship turns. But anyway, they all point to DITSCAP, something you should be familiar with. What does certification mean within the Department of the Navy or Department of Defense, does that matter? How many of y'all have ever been involved in the certification view of, of a system? Just a couple of people? Pretty exhaustive, pretty... Lots of details. You've got to be a lover of details to go through one of these, right? You never know what you're going to run into. Like one night we were talking, well, I actually ran this little, well, I actually attacked one network one night. And the only reason they figured out that I was attacking it was the night watchman said, you know, the phones rang all night. I never could figure out. Well, I started a war dialer. And I called. I figured the number of the command was 656-2000. So I figured 2000 and all the numbers above. So I started a little dialer. I found all 90 modems that were connected to the computer network. Why are there 90 modems on this stupid network? They all are connected to Nippernet. Well, they ordered them from Dell, and they came that way. Comprehensive technological review. But you're not asking the real question was, how did they all get hooked up? Comprehensive evaluation of your IT system. PMW 161 down in San Diego is the certification agent for the Navy. And we go out and look in tremendous detail at the Navy systems. That's how we've discovered the errant connection directly between Nippernet and Snippernet. That's how we've discovered that one major combatant was totally infected with the uh, back orifice Trojan. My son did that at his university the other day, and he loves doing that to people's computers and opening the CD drawer. <laughs> anyway, this is the detail of what we're doing. 
And it's both a physical and electronic techniques that you go out. We look at policies. Have you designated? Is anybody in this room being a designated approving authority, a DAA? Nobody has? Do you even know? Have you ever even heard the term? Okay, you said it's usually your CO. Uh, we make sure that people are enforcing policy, such as when somebody leaves the command, you really do deactivate their account. And it's not once a year. It's kind of like, didn't we just go through this last August where we had to change all the passwords? That was a tremendously expensive undertaking. We really don't want to do that again. Once you get a certification for your system, you go through the accreditation process. And this is where somebody actually signs on the line. My system is safe. My system has met all the requirements. That's typically the CO that does that. For the Navy as a whole, CNO uh, N64 is the DAA for Navy-wide systems, specifically uh, Ms. Louise Davidson on the OPNAV staff, N643. They're the ones certifying things such as the INSEPS, Navy Standard Integrated Personnel System. They'll be the one, she'll be the one certifying DTS, the Defense Travel Service, coming up on the Nipper Net, all these different systems. But at your command level, the DAA is typically the commanding officer. When you talk about accrediting, this has become a major issue. As systems move off of dedicated links and move on to the Nipper Net, now why would they want to do that? save money. You're not paying for a dedicated T1 anymore that you're only using 56K of anymore. You're going to share it with your whole command. Anytime you take an existing system, such as the F-18 maintenance system, and connect it to a naval network, you have to then step back and say, what is the impact to the network of what I'm about to do? The basis document, if you haven't seen one of these, you should see them at your command or when somebody delivers you a system, is called the SSAA Systems Security Authorization Agreement. And it truly is an agreement. The person building your system has to sell it to all four of these people in order to get it accredited and approved for use. Kind of the checkoff list you have to do, assess risks. What is the risk to the Navy standard information, I mean, personnel information system? What would be the risk? If it doesn't work, you don't get paid. Now that just went above the tomahawks, right? <laughs> uh, big issues that come along with these different systems. So when you assess risks, you have to look truly at all the risks physical, to electronic, to network, to being observed, what these risks are. When we sit down within PMW 161 to advise a Navy program developer, we talk about your system cannot stand alone anymore. Nippernet gets 65% of its connectivity through internet, whatever that means. For example, I was down in Pensacola, Florida the other day, and was looking at the Chief of Naval Education and Training and all their big thing, and I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, this is really curious. You have your Nippernet connection. Yes, it's a T1. What are all these lines labeled UUNet? Oh, well, we get 75% of our connectivity through MCI. Why don't you use DIS's Nippernet connection? It's too slow. Can't upgrade it. Whatever. And that's the true case. We tried turning off the Nippernet or disconnecting the Nippernet one time from the internet. Didn't work. Did not work. There are too many interconnections, too many other ways for information to flow, and Cisco's wonderful routers will always find the first path or the open path. So, have any of you have heard of the Information Assurance Technical Framework? Okay? If you haven't, you ought to look at that. That's kind of becoming the guidance for the entire Department of, of Defense in the area of technical composition of an information assurance policy. And let me stress that. The technical portion of the Navy's IA and DOD's IA posture. Uh, if you want to 
put a firewall on your system. Well, what makes a good firewall from a bad firewall? It's a bad firewall. With, well, the real issue with the Pack Fleet when we changed the firewall policy, we stopped all JavaScript from going through the firewall. That means you can't get to www.navyfcu.org. We'll talk about defense in depth. Common criteria tested products. Recent decision came out that said if you're going to attach any information assurance device to a DOD network, by July of 2001, your product must be common criteria tested. Can you think of a device today that is common criteria tested? All the piece of crypto gear, like the KG84. There are very specific requirements that have to be met and tested in order that be a valid U.S. cryptographic product. We're also looking at commercial best practices. It makes no sense for the Navy to put out a virtual private network device that can't talk to anybody else. It's kind of a paradigm shift from what we normally do. Isn't it? And we are looking very specifically at devices that are certified by the International Computer Security or uh, association. We even say that our Navy network shall use protocols and systems that meet the Internet, Internet Engineering Task Force. How many of you all have heard of IETF? Hopefully just about everybody has dealt with networks. If you haven't, they define things like what IP is, and what TCP is, and all those little things that make the Internet go. There's a whole working group under the IETF that I deal with quite a bit. It's called the Security Working Group. And they define things such as when you make a secure transaction on the web, use something called SSL. That's an IETF standard now, originally developed and copyrighted by Netscape, but they have been able to turn it over now to the IETF. You never know what you're getting into. I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, my wife was ordering an online product, and she kind of thinks I'm weird, but of course she's sitting there, and I look over her shoulder, and I said, is that a 128-bit website? She looks over at me and says, what are you talking about? And I slid the little cursor down and it says 40-bit SSL. And I said, no, you shouldn't do that. I only use high assurance websites. Let's see, 800. So she calls the 800 number, right? And it starts to place her order. And she gets through the whole order and the lady on the other end goes, you know, if you order this online, you can save the shipping. And my wife, Mary, goes, well, I'm online right here, but I can't use this because my husband says it's a 40-bit SSL and 728-bit SSL. Are, are you still there? <laughs> well, anyway, so she goes to the explanation, and then lo and behold, the lady says, uh, I'm in a central ordering system in Phoenix, Arizona, and when you dialed in on this 800 number, you just launched my Internet browser to the company's web page. And I'm entering in your order on exactly the same page that you're looking at. And my little thing says 40-bit SSL at the bottom, too. And uh, you never know. You really never know. That one representative was actually taking orders for over 200 companies. And they were all launching her Netscape browser as the call came in to a specific website. So best engineering practices. Big question came up. The other day, what is the DOD directive that requires 128-bit SSL for our secure web services? Good. I'm glad nobody came up with one because there isn't one. But your response should be thinking best commercial practices. Why wouldn't you use 128-bit encryption? I mean, Navy Federal does, Bank of America does. It comes free with Netscape and Internet Explorer. Why wouldn't you use it? So that's the thinking we're hoping people get into. Nine major areas that under the Information Assurance Technical Framework we try to address with each Information Assurance area. Uh, these are probably the five areas that we stress the most. Oh, I hope you haven't had a flattering time like that one. Uh, we do have quite a bit of hacks going on maybe Navy pages. You know what's one of the ones that frustrates us the most are the insider attacks. What do you think the number one cause for 
insider information assurance problems. What, what's the number one cause? What? Revenge. Ah, revenge. Actually, that's very small. Very, very small. Curiosity. 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 Oh, somebody said it. Boredom. Boredom. No, not boredom. You drink more <laughs> coffee when you get bored. Ignorance. 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 We had a guy change one line in a Cisco router iOS code that completely changed one of the entire routing methods for this base and disabled one of the firewalls. ignorance about the big picture and I'm hoping that you are getting the big picture while you're here at MPS. Lack of knowledge, lack of training. How many Cisco certified internetworking engineers are on active duty? Excuse me, CCIEs. There are 5,000 in the world certified by Cisco, they draw about $600 an hour when they're out working. It takes an average four to six years to get it. It's a two-day test, and the Navy has zero on active duty. This is a structure showing, well, it probably has something to do with the pay line. Though. Anyway, why? This is showing you the state of today's information assurance technical framework within the Department of Defense. There's a lot of stuff in this view that's kind of grayed out or kind of shaded out a little bit. That means we're still working on this. These policies, these ideas are being developed as we speak. You actually have an ability here at NPS to influence these. I routinely see NPS and your research and things mentioned when we talk about discussions of different information assurance activities. All right. Communities is a good touchy-feely word, right? Well, we speak of these five communities plus a little bit being those people that I have to serve from an information assurance framework. From a classification sense, I have to keep them all apart. From an assurance sense, I have to make sure that they can interoperate. How do we pass secret information to unclassified networks? This was a trick question. You're all supposed to say in unison, you never do that, right? You never take secret and go to unclass. However, you do take unclass and go up to secret, right? Just like the captain in Norfolk did when he worked on that document that night on his home computer, put it on his floppy, popped it on the cybernet, completely affected the cybernet with the most of ours. But anyway, we have devices called high assurance guards that look at content and decide whether or not it can pass down. How do you look at the content of a picture and determine what its classification is automatically? It's like the IT2 aboard one of our carriers that wanted to show his wife where he was working and took this neat digital picture of CIC one night. <laughs> and of course, it was such a great picture that the ombudsman had to post it to the ship's website. And then it got emailed to all the wives. Anyway, it's very difficult to look at a fax, to look at an MPEG-3 file. And I haven't even addressed the issues of steganography, the ability to hide content in something. Today, our guard technology is pretty much limited to textual-based messaging, emails, that type of thing, emails without attachments. How do we electronically separate these? All these five could write on the same fiber. We use crypto equipment, right? We have extremely elaborate systems to handle keys, to detect equipment. Well, this is now applying within the unclassified network structure. How do I protect Privacy Act information? How, when you fill out your travel claim and enter your social security number, your bank account, and all that information that gets shipped over the internet, how are we protecting that? Very important issues brought up here. This is what the Department of Defense designs as a uh, mission-critical information system. 
This is the other two categories, and it's amazing. 90% of the things connected to the Nippernet are now mission critical. Right now, you're probably in the high assurance crypto area used to the fancy, the old KG84s. 64 kilobits, you know, just, just good old systems out there. One chip on the right side can handle 20 simultaneous KG84s. This is what's going in the joint tactical radio, the digital modular radio. This will be in the heart of the Virginia class radio room. This, time, this is what's happening to cryptographic protections. Except there's one thing. Technology doesn't solve it all. If I have a, a lights out radio room, which is what people are designing today, what happens if the keys get compromised and I can't talk to the light, lights out radio room to rekey the system? You can have an, I, an IP connected supernet terminal on any desk in the, in the Navy now. We can put a KG-175 TAC lane, which is a high assurance IPsec connected device right on there. Everything's encrypted just like you want. $6,800 a piece, not bad for a piece of crypto gear. One guy asked me the other day, he said, well, you know, we've got to have these multiple systems sitting there in the CIC. I've got to be able to have the British guy sitting next to the American guy sitting next to the Canadian guy. We're all going to be collaborating and passing stuff, and it's going to be great. It's called Coalition Ops. And I said, What's the USI going to be looking at? He said, Supernet. That's a US only system. He's sitting right, his 21 inch liquid crystal display is sitting right next to the Canadian guy. How are you going to do that? Don't forget the fundamentals when you talk about this type of stuff. FIPS 140. Every non classified system in the United States Navy has to be tested and certified. Your Netscape browser has gone through FIPS 140 certification. So has Internet Explorer, so has Windows 2000, so has PGP, all those devices. Anybody heard of AES, the big shootout that's going now? It's the new advanced encryption system that's coming out for unclassified applications. It has to run everything from your Palm Pilot to a smart card to a Cray to everything else. Big shootout now. If you're interested in cryptographic work, I'd tell you to look at that. Defend the network. Got to keep everything up and running. The one piece we mentioned here is we build this multiple layer of defense in depth. And one of the most commonly overlooked things is the network infrastructure. If I take over your router running your base, I own you. Yet everybody's worried about passwords and user IDs and, and stuff like that. Uh, defense in depth objectives. By the way, there is a new DOD memorandum that's just about to be released on the overall guidance and information assurance policy for the Department of Defense, which is where these definitions are coming from. I'll run through these pretty quickly. Got the good buzzwords. Uh, we truly are in an overall grid. If we had to drop the internet ever down, whatever that means, DOD would be in a world of hurt. Navy billets are being stood up as we speak at the Joint Task Force for Computer Network Defense. Might be a position you want to look at following your tour here at NPS. Here are the basic networks that we run across the Department of Defense. You haven't been aware of those. Whenever you look at it, we try to keep people from focusing on these buzzwords on the pad here on the left. We try to keep people focused on what policy are you going to have. For example, there will be no games on the Department of Defense networks. Everybody ran out and took solitaire off the windows. And the seamen aboard the Blue Ridge found out there were 21 sites on the internet that had solitaire games, so they tied up all the bandwidth playing solitaire. <laughs> there will be no personal email done on our system. How many people in the Navy? or registered on Hotmail. The estimate is over 150,000. Do you know there was a Navy ship, and I won't mention the name, that actually went out and registered their ship.com? Anyway, focus on the big picture. Focus on the big picture of what you're trying to do and the implications across the enterprise. Two types of problems that I'm dealing with. One is the hacker. You've seen a hacker, right? 
guy with a little hat, trench coat, beady eyes. What is the profile of today's hacker? Oh, he's in his early 20s, eats pizza a lot, wears stained t-shirts, rather overweight. Still has beady eyes because he's been in front of a monitor too long. Uh, anybody in here remember the Cult of the Dead Cows? <laughs> not anyone, not going to tell you. Anyway, misuse prevention is a big key for the Navy. How many of you know what this command's policy is for the proper and accepted use of the Navy, Naval Postgraduate School computing services? You should, and each command has a minimum policy for trying to Whatever you do, these should not weaken your overall authority, overall security profile. You should be clearly defining these to the people at your command. Defend the enclave boundary. This is called the Navy or Department of Defense's defense in depth strategy, which says we're going to have these spigots and we're going to have multiple ways of preventing what goes through and we're going to not trust you even then and we're going to have a way of monitoring what's going on, the defense, the intrusion detection. So supposedly from the internet to the actual individual users within a ship, we have layered policy. For example, when we cut off all JavaScript to the Pacific Fleet Nippernet connections, I went to one firewall product, brought up the HTTP proxy on Gauntlet, and clicked Stop JavaScript. That's all it took. Problem was, is we did a survey of 150 significant sites in the Navy, and all 150 had JavaScript on the web page. Again, what the definitions of the boundary enclaves, again, they relate back to the DOD. We're most focused with the idea of flow across the enclave boundaries. Flow across the boundaries is a big issue. Here is what is going to be present at each of the fleet network operating centers. These are being installed as we speak. The routers are Cisco 7500 series. The intrusion detection are Cisco net rangers. The bastion host firewalls or gauntlets. I mean, this is being literally wired up as we speak in Naples and Waiwa and Norfolk. Specific caches, web servers, uh, PKI directories, and there was something called DMS. Yes, it's integrated in the system. Out to your application workstation. That's what's being put in. That's the Cypernet enclave that's sitting in Norfolk. Looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Wait a minute. Why? Do we have a virtual private network device on Cypernet? I thought the whole thing was encrypted. I mean, it's secret US only, right? Why is there another encryption device running on Cypernet? Need to know. Need to know, exactly. And that is being implemented in a part of it. But look at the other components. Web servers, things like that. By the way, what's the number one most demanded piece of software to run on Cypernet today? All right. Solitaire. Yes. Well, not solitaire. <laughs> Good guess, though. Uh, take a guess. What do you think the number one most demanded piece of software on the Cypernet is today? It's called AOL Instant Messenger. Today's order wires between the comm centers are on AOL Instant Messenger. How do you do an air tasking order? You bring it up in a Microsoft Net Meeting in an Excel spreadsheet and move targets around. Scary, isn't it? But this is the structure that's actually in place in Norfolk on the Cypernet. Here's what industry is saying they're doing. There's a problem with this slide, by the way. Why wouldn't every single 100% of every IA professional have virus, antivirus software on their systems? You know what I like? I like infecting people's computers with NetBus. And I love sitting there and opening and closing the CD drawer while they're sitting there. Firewalls. All these devices are parts of today's Navy networks. We're not that much different. How many of you knew that if you go to infosec.navy.mil, 
The DOD contract for both Norton and McAfee says you as a government employee can take the whole thing home free. Okay? Why don't you have antivirus on every computer you have? It's free. Fourth area, computing environment. How do you, yes, question. What's the average age of the virus definition on those? If, if you have, do you have any kind of numbers on that? Uh, the yeah. average age. When I was at a conference at PAC, or at, at NAV Euro last September in Naples, they had set up workstations so everybody could telecommute back to their office and get email. That was November 99, the virus <laughs> definition for July 1997. And that was put up by NCTC Europe. Uh, the answer is Norton has come out with as many as five virus definition updates in one week. And when we do an antivirus symposium, we tell the network administrators to update your virus, check for virus updates daily. Daily. Number one IA threat in the Navy from outsiders are viruses. Are they being reported? We started a network uh, virus seminar in San Diego last year, and I said, how many of y'all saw Melissa on your, no, wait a minute, Melissa virus on your networks? And about 50 people raised their hands. And I said, that's real interesting. And Commander Jim McGovern, who's the XL of FIWIC in Norfolk, said, that really is interesting. That's more than the total reports we received of the Melissa virus infection for the entire United States Navy. People are not reporting them. A lot of you deal with computer codes and stuff. For example, how do you know that Windows NT coming off that CD is Windows NT? How do you know that the track posted to the track database manager on the global command and control system was put there by an authorized person when it was put there and hasn't been changed? The whole idea of the trusted computing environment is a huge issue today, and we're looking for solutions. We really are looking for solutions today. Uh, that is a real problem. There was a malicious plant of a replacement of something called spool.dll. Y'all ever heard of that file? It's a file on Windows NT that sends everything to the printer. Someone had substituted on a Navy system a spool idea, exact same bit length, exact same file date, that happened to print everything on that network at a foreign location. Definition of <laughs> environmental and defense objectives. Secure configurations. If you get out there, Spalwar publishes, it was developed by NSA, a Windows NT secure configuration guide. Lots of little things like when it boots up, you know, you have your little login window. Was the last person that used it, is his user ID still there? Shouldn't be. One check in your registry changes it. Shouldn't be. That configuration guide is out there. Yes, we do use a lot of Linux in the Navy. It's growing quite well. You can order Dell systems, compact systems delivered to you running Unix. There's actually a consortium called the Bastille Linux Consortium that's putting together a secure version of, of Linux. All these operating systems. Yes, Windows 2000 is rolling out in the Atlantic Fleet headquarters as we speak. Good code versus bad code. Number of mean encounters per thousand PCs that we've seen viruses. That's a curve you don't want to get. What's the number one way to catch a virus in the Navy? Uh, computer virus in the Navy. <laughs> What's the number one way? Sorry about that. Microsoft Word. Passing documents around. Why do you route a final signed document as a Word document? Why don't you use something called Adobe PDF? format that you cannot embed a virus in yet. It costs extra. Yeah. It costs extra, but the Navy has enterprise licenses, and you can get a very inexpensive server for it. And it's much cheaper than one virus infection. Talk about the guys in the Blue Ridge that decided to finally load Norton antivirus on their exchange server, and the system crashed at 5,500 virus-infected emails. 
and it took us five days to rebuild their entire email system. Email is how it's getting distributed these days, folks. Comes all kinds of different sources. We had one guy bring in a, a CD out of one of the gaming magazines, loaded on his desktop aboard ship to play, you know, one of the 30-day games. It was virus infected. IBM actually delivered about 1,000 computers to the Navy, infected with the Chernobyl virus as they delivered them. Supporting infrastructures. How many of you have your DOD smart card? DOD certificate? Come on. Right over here in Monterey, the DEER system, you've all dealt with DEERs, right? Uh, DEERs, the rapid station, will by a year from now be issuing you your common access card, which will be a 16 kilobit memory smart card running certain cryptographic algorithms on it, allowing you to sign email, access buildings, everything else. The whole supporting infrastructure, and I stress again the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. If you're dealing with transactions with commerce, industry today in the Navy, you have to be playing by the same rules. Uh, again, different parts of the uh, infrastructure objectives. What public keying systems, you ought to, if you don't know what a public key is, you probably should because you're going to have one very shortly. Directories. Anybody use the Navy Marine Corps internet? I mean, what white pages? dir.navy.mil. Updated every night by the 32 major claimants. Contains over 500,000 email addresses. What are we most worried about in access to the Navy white pages? Commercial use of those white pages. There are actually court martials every year in the Navy for people selling social rosters. I'm popping this. One of the big issues we're looking at is what is a break-in? I talked about this earlier, intrusion detections. This is Dorothy Denning's model. These are the two ways you detect someone breaking in or activities on a network. We're looking at, we're starting projects here at NPS to try to better how we do these. Am I so worried about looking at what's in an email that you've got the Melissa virus infection? Or can I tell your network's infected by the fact that the enterprises email count went from 3,000 to 65,000 emails in one day. Was that Melissa virus or was that Desert Storm? One of the problems we're running in intrusion detection is these are things intrusion detections will not do. Intrusion detection didn't find that Trojan. How did the guy notice that there was that funny file on his system? Every time he printed to the laser printer right next to him, it used to print almost immediately. Now it's taking 30 or 60 seconds before it starts. Everybody's worried about the outside hacker. We as the Navy have to worry about a very special hacker called the state-sponsored hacker. What does it take for that sponsor to get passwords in the Navy? That's the password stealing method. You caught that, right? look over somebody's shoulder and you can get it. There are sites on the internet today that include Navy passwords and the active account names for places like hq.navy.mil, bupers.navy.mil, stanford.edu. They're published out on the internet today. Backups. Does your command do backups? You're all supposed to be doing this if you're in the fleet, right? One guy says, though, I'm on a frigate. How do I do an off-site backup? I know, burn a CD-ROM, throw it in the mail. As a composite IA approach, this seems to be the big glory area, all the little nuts and bolts and firewalls and IDSs and all the neat, slick stuff you can buy. I hope <coughs> NPS is playing a very, as a matter of fact, I don't hope, I know NPS is playing a very important role in this side. Who is your IT person running it on your ship? Have they gone through an IT security school? <clears throat> Does the DAA aboard your ship even know what they're doing? 
all of these areas have to be addressed. And as you leave MPS to go to your next job, I hope you'll be thinking about this. It's a daily routine. We talk about IA at quarters. How many times have you ever been to quarters and heard somebody talk about information security? That's the answer I thought I would get in this room. It's typical of the whole Navy. Why don't we think, and I use this analogy, would you take all of the personnel records at your command and take the physical filing cabinets and put them just outside the fence out here on Highway 1? No, don't answer that. <laughs> if you're not properly connecting your personnel office, you're doing exactly the same thing. You're doing exactly the same thing. We are truly an overall DOD policy, and PMW-161 is the Navy element trying to implement that. What I want to leave you with today is I hope here at NPS you are getting that big picture. You can help us get answers to these very, very difficult questions. And I hope your command will have a little different security posture and IQ than this. And I'll open it up for any questions you might have. Anybody had a hot computer? Yes, question. How, how good are the measures you're buying the products from like firewalls are about telling you that they've been broken? Or they, they, they've had intrusions? You know, we actually have a pretty good relationship with most of the vendors. Uh, we have a big meeting with Cisco Monday, as a matter of fact, to talk about some issues about their security products. Uh, we have tended to stray away from people that are not open. And now we have the hammer to say, if you're going to sell your firewall to the Department of Defense, we'll have an independent third party do it, and you have to pass a common criteria test. And that's kind of been the approach. Yes? Does the does MPS fall under your purview for the uh, certification? And PMW 161 is the certification authority for all of Navy, not the accrediting agency. That's the admiral here. Well, how many of these systems are actually certified? Quite a few, actually. We've got a whole list, it's thousands. Well, the reason I ask this question is because, of course, I had last quarter, we went through the DISCAP process on systems here in this building, and most of the people that were the system administrators couldn't answer 75% of the questions. They had no clue as to what they were supposed to be doing with this stuff. What you've addressed is the problem that I talked about earlier, which is DITSCAP for most of these commands was a fixed point. Rarely has the command gone back through the effort to update that. How many times around here does the MPS system change? I bet, for example, when you went to the main ATM backbone here on campus, it didn't change. And that's the problem, really, I think you're addressing. And it's something we just, in 161, don't have the resources to go back to and find, let alone go back and do the recertification. We don't even know the changes are being made. Where they are, we try to go back and address them. Do you have any boilerplate that's supposed to go into the A-76 contract? Boilerplate for that. The one thing that I would have to ask about the A-76 contract is for DOD shore activities, how is that going to play with the Navy Marine Corps Intranet Award? We're asking that same question because we're going to be affected by both. When you get an answer, let me know. There is a one there. No, there is a one. Yes, question. You mentioned earlier that by using the different net we can save money. Has there been a change in DISA? Because always from Spay War, it's been uh, <coughs> DISA is unresponsive and over, overpriced. For service. Uh, all I can say is two thirds of the nipper net capacity is provided by non DISA resources. But they still manage. Two thirds of the nipper net <laughs> connectivity is provided by something that DISA has no hand on whatsoever. For example, the CNET. Three T1s leased directly from UUNet, one T1 from this one. Other questions? No, our quiet audience. Yes? What's being done to make sure this gap is uh, actually the whole process is being performed everywhere it should be performed? Why, how, is DITS, how are we ensuring that this gap is being done? Uh, the answer is we only know that it needs to be done on systems and because so much stink is being made about break-ins and uh, 
cutting off fleet sailors, access to Navy Federal and everything else. There's a lot of interest right now in information assurance. And all the major claimants, NAV, C, and everything else are, are coming now and asking, where's your SSAA? Where's your certification documents? Uh, we're about to start a uh, seminar series for program managers and commanding officers and stuff to raise this again to them. And that's how we're trying to address it. Question. Boy, you're an easy group. Uh, if you have any questions about specifics in the Navy IA system, what's going on, I'd be glad to address them. We do have research work that goes on here at NPS associated with it. Uh, how many Navy computers are out there? What's the estimate of the Navy Marine Corps intranet, a big contract that's under about to be awarded? How many computers sitting on desktops? Try 800,000. 800,000 is a pretty good sized organization. It's a heck of a lot bigger than Navy Federal. A little bit more broadly dispersed. Oh, by the way, that's just within the continental United States. That includes every reserve unit, every recruiter, every whatever. Lots of other questions. One last, I think we're running out of time. Uh -huh. um, if intrusion detection doesn't work, why is it in so many of these pictures? If intrusion detection doesn't work, why is it in so many pictures? I'm not saying that it doesn't work. It's not as thorough as it should be. 250,000 well, well, 250,000 well, it's better than a lot of them. <laughs> it's better than doing nothing. Okay. Uh, we probably, with intrusion detection today, catch the casual student hacker. We don't catch the real pro. State-sponsored. We don't catch those guys with Cisco. It's an interesting thing. How can you have an intrusion detection system look for something that's so classified, nobody will even admit that it happens? If not, thank you very much.